The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. You know, Satan loves to attack. You never know exactly when he's going to attack, but the first place that he attacks is your mind. The mind is the battlefield. Have you ever had one of those days where you just didn't know what in the world was wrong with you, but you just had some of the most stinking thinking about people? And it, it's just like, why am I even thinking that? But your thinking is just off. And then, you know, you begin to get irritated with the people and you're like, what is wrong with me? You know, Satan loves to attack. You never know exactly when he's going to attack, but the first place that he attacks is your mind. The mind is the battlefield. You have to really pay attention to what you're thinking. You have to think about what you're thinking about because if you don't choose your thinking, if you become passive, you're just kind of empty headed, the devil will be happy to fill your mind with stuff that is going to poison your spiritual life. More than anything, people buy my book, Battlefield of the Mind, more than any of the other books we have, which only proves to me that people have lots of problems with their mind. So we know that Satan's a liar and that he uses thoughts, wrong thoughts, to try to bring destruction into our life. We know that he is a destroyer and that the weapon he uses is suffering. We taught about that this morning. That Satan wants to destroy lots of things, but mainly he wants to destroy our faith. And he uses suffering to do that whether it's suffering from rejection or suffering from abuse when you were a child or suffering from peer pressure or suffering, he'll attack your body if he can. That's why it's important to be in as good a health as you can possibly be. So when things try to attack your body, you've got a good strong immune system to fight those things off. We are so bad at not doing what's right until we have an emergency. And we need to get beyond that and start really doing the thing that's right all the way along. So, Satan wants to rule us. His target is our will. We, have, we are spirits, we have a soul, we live in a body, you're a tripart being. Think with me for a minute. You have a spirit, that's where the Holy Spirit lives. That's where you get revelation from God. That's where you have intuition. You have a conscience in there that tells you right from wrong. That's where you fellowship with God. That's where you communicate with God. But you have a soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's your personality. You have a body. When we look at one another, we see each other's bodies, but there's a lot more to us than just that outer shell that we see. And even though your spirit might be in good shape because you've received Christ as your Savior and He's cleaned up everything in there and made you holy because He can't dwell any place that's not holy, you can have a, a really right heart and a right spirit and still have a messed up soul. You can still have a messed up mind. Your will can still be stubborn and, and prideful and your emotions can still be a wreck. And the sad thing is, is in order for what's in your spirit to get out through your body where it can do anybody any good, your soul has to have a work done in it because everything from your spirit has to come through your soul. I'm ministering to you, but in many ways, it's coming through my personality, through my voice. I had to think about this message. I had to choose to be here. So many people have the opportunity to do something great with their life, but they never get their soul dealt with. In Hebrews 4, it says, only the Word of God can divide soul and spirit. Why is it important for you to learn how to divide soul and spirit? Simply because your soul doesn't tell you anything about God. It only tells you about you. Your soul doesn't tell you what God thinks. It tells you what you think. It doesn't tell you what God feels. It tells you what you feel. And it doesn't tell you what God wants. It tells you what you want. If we want to know what God wants, thinks, and feels, then we've got to let this Word of God be the number one thing in our life that guides us. It's greater than what I think or what you think. It's greater than what I reason out or understand or don't understand. 
It's greater than anything that I feel. It doesn't matter how I feel. The Word of God is the Word of God. If I don't feel God loves me, well, He does. I don't feel that I've got a future. Well, you do. <laughs> I don't feel like I'll ever be able to get over my past. Well, you can. And more than anything, people talk about how they feel. I wonder sometimes if we're serving the God of our feelings or the God of the Bible. I feel, I feel, and I don't feel, and I don't feel. We have to understand the importance of honoring and respecting the Word of God above what we think, what we want, and what we feel. I'm frequently asked how I feel about things like traveling. Joyce, how do you feel about traveling all the time? Well, the only way I can do it is because I don't ask myself how I feel. You see, you get in a lot of trouble when you start asking yourself how you feel. When you start letting your feelings vote, you're already on your way down. <laughs> Satan will use your feelings to control you, to keep you out of the will of God. I was going to Papua New Guinea several months ago. Long trip, 40 hours in a plane there and back. Jet lag going, jet lag coming. Body all messed up. Sleep patterns messed up. Are you excited about going to Papua New Guinea, Joyce? <laughs> and that always, people always want to know if I'm excited about this and that and something else. And the interesting thing is, is I really wasn't excited about going, but I was committed to go. And there's a big difference in excitement and commitment. Amen? Now, come on, you say, you weren't excited. <laughs> well, I've done this over and over. I know what it involves. Now, the first time I went, I was excited. Once I got jet lag, I wasn't excited anymore. <laughs> Once I wanted to sleep all day and stay awake all night, I wasn't excited anymore. I came out of there, I had got some kind of bug in my stomach. I got on my plane, one hour after I was on the plane, I started throwing up, and you have not done anything fun till you sit on an airplane for 22 hours when you are sick to your stomach and just want to crawl up in a hole and die. No, I was not excited. And that's nothing to be ashamed about. That doesn't mean that my heart is not right. It means that I've learned to live beyond how I feel. I'd much rather have somebody that's committed to me than somebody that is excited. That's what happens to so many marriages when the excitement goes, which it will. <laughs> Come on. If you've been married 10 years, I'll bet when your man walks in, you don't get goosebumps all over you. <laughs> but hopefully and prayerfully, it grows beyond that to something much deeper and much more serious. Dave and I have been married 42 and a half years, and I can tell you that we are committed to one another. But Satan wants to control us, and one of the main things that he does is he lies to us, and then if we believe those lies, it begins to affect our emotions, and if we get too emotional, then it begins to affect our decisions, and things just get to be a mess. So Satan wants us to be independent of God's will, he wants us to do our own thing. He also wants us to become passive. And to be passive means that you're not using your will to make decisions, but you're waiting to be moved by an outside force. You're waiting to feel like doing it. That is a huge, huge problem today because we have gotten lazy in our society. We get upset if the escalator isn't working and we have to walk up a flight of stairs when we're out in the shopping mall. We get impatient if our internet hookup takes 45 seconds instead of 10 seconds to hook us up. We get angry if our cell phone with its iPod and it's where you can communicate around the world. I mean, I sit and talk to my son when he's in Indonesia and Africa and India and we're just going back and forth just like this. But boy, you let that thing not work once. 
So we're kind of addicted to convenience. We have to understand that if we're going to be really successful Christians that know how to defeat the devil, we're going to have to have a little bit of commitment and a little bit of strength and a little bit of willpower to go through some things and not just give up every time something doesn't feel good. Can anybody say amen? amen. The Christian must not be emotional. <laughs> Now, I didn't say that you can't have emotions. You can enjoy emotions. We saw our emotions being displayed tonight as we were worshiping God. And to be honest, that's one of the best places to use them. A lot of people say, well, I just don't want to get involved in all that religious emotionalism. But that same person will act like a fool at a football game. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But to be emotional means that you are led by those feelings. I can't help how I feel a lot of times, and you can't either. Emotions are not going to go away, but we must learn how to manage them and not let them manage us. You have made great progress when you can feel all the wrong things and still choose by using your will to do the right thing. Let me tell you something. That is victory and that is power. Power over Satan doesn't mean that we have this authority that can keep him at bay to where he can never attack us, never lie to us, never come against us. The power that we have is when he is attacking us, we don't have to act like him. See, I used to think that resisting the devil meant that if I really exercise my faith enough, I should be able to keep him from bothering me. And God said, no, when he bothers you, I've given you power not to act like him. We're supposed to be acting like God in the midst of our trials and tribulations. Emotional people make a lot of very serious mistakes. They live by how they feel. They make decisions by how they feel and they end up not obeying God. Decisions mold our character and they chart the course of your life. Love, for example, is a major theme in the Word of God and yet it's so lacking in the church today. We have to be very careful that the church doesn't just become a social club where we all go to be entertained. We bring great music. We have a wonderful time. We should have a good time in church. But there's also times for getting serious and hearing a strong word from God. Don't get upset if you don't get dessert every time you go to church. Sometimes you need meat and vegetables that you don't like. You need to hear the part of the word that you'd really, really rather not hear. But it's what you need to hear. We need to hear about love, and we need to know that it's more than some kind of sloppy agape where we hug each other and say, I love you with the love of the Lord. <laughs> but don't call me and ask me for a ride because I don't want to go out of my way to pick you up. <laughs> but I love you with the love of the Lord. <laughs> Come on now. Is anybody there? <laughs> love is not a matter of how I feel or don't feel. It's not a feeling, it's a willing. It's something that I have to do on purpose. You can choose to walk in love. You say, well, I don't even like the person. How can I love them? Whether you like them or not has nothing to do with loving them. Love is not a feeling, it's an action. It's the way you decide to treat them no matter how you feel about them. Did anybody hear what I said? I think if we're going to describe love, the way to do it is to say love is really all about how we treat people. And especially how we treat people that we don't particularly care for. Our people that have hurt us. Our people that aren't particularly nice to us sometimes. And this is not my idea. It's God's idea. The Bible says that we are to put on love. What in the world does that mean? How do you put on love? Love, it's talking about making a decision. Putting on means to make a decision. I put on my clothes every day. And when I put them on, I try to make sure 
that they look right on me. You're dressed spiritually when you go out of your house. You're not just dressed in your outer garment, but you're dressed spiritually. You have to put on mercy, put on kindness, put on patience. And the Bible says in Colossians 3, and above all that you put on, above all that you put on, put on love. That means before you ever go out your door in the morning, you need to have a talk with yourself and you need to make some decisions. You need to say things like, now I already know ahead of time before I go out the door that everything's not going to go my way today. And I'm deciding right now that even when I don't get my way, I'm going to remain patient and I'm going to remain godly. You set your mind and keep it set is what Colossians 3 says. But what do we do? We're passive. We're empty-headed. We, we don't get up and pray because we don't feel like getting up. And then we lay in bed too long, and now we got to get to work. And now we're under all this pressure, and now all this stuff starts to go wrong, and we're getting madder and madder and blaming everybody in the house. Now before we leave, we're yelling and screaming at everybody. Then we get out in traffic, and traffic is not right, and we're giving all kinds of hand signals to the other people in the cars. I had one of those yesterday right here in Atlanta. Woo, man. We made some kind of little mistake. I guess got in this guy's lane or got in front of him or something. And man, he came by and gave us the sign, and it wasn't the one you'd like to have. And I've learned. Hey, I've learned. He ain't getting my joy. No. I don't have no time to get mad and be bothered by it. I just said out loud, bless you, bless you, have a nice day, bless you. You know what, I've come to the point where I feel sorry for people that they have to get that upset because somebody actually dared to accidentally make a mistake and get in their way just a little bit. But I tell you what, the world out there is explosive. People are just ready to blow at any minute because of the pressure that they've got in their lives. They're living by emotions. They're living off the top of their head. They're doing what they feel. They're not making decisions according to the Word of God. They're not making decisions that are wise. People go out and buy things impulsively, and then they got all this pressure from debt, and now they're mad at everybody and mad at their boss because he don't pay them enough, and now it's his fault that you got financial pressure. Come on, I'm preaching good. It's not your boss's responsibility to overpay you for doing your job because you got out and got in the flesh and charged everything you could charge. It's our responsibility to live within our means and learn how to wait on some things and to realize we don't have to have everything and not flip plastic everywhere we go, but be willing to either do without some things that we can do without and save money to pay cash for them. Come on now, I'm preaching good. But when you're led by emotions, my goodness, you go out, you see that 75% off sale sign, and you'll buy everything you can get your hands on just because it's on sale. Can't pass up that bargain. I tell a story about a woman whose husband said, honey, you've got to stop shopping. We've got to get out of debt. She, he made her promise. She promised that she would not go out and buy any more clothes. She went to the mall to pick up something that she had to, to have that she had ordered, and while she was there, she saw this pretty dress that was on sale, and so she went into the store just to try it on, just to see what it looked like. <laughs> you know, that's kind of like bringing chocolate fudge brownies into your house <laughs> to look at them, but not planning to eat them. <laughs> oh, well, I'm just bringing this cake mix in for my kids. No, you ain't. No, you're not. If you want to give your kids cake, then take them somewhere and feed it to them, but don't bring it in the house and sit there and stare at it if you have a problem with it. <laughs> so anyway, she went home with the dress, kind of hoping he wouldn't see her, but he saw her bring it in, and right away he blew up. 
I thought you promised me that you weren't going to buy any more clothes. She said, but honey, this dress was on sale and I tried it on and it just looked so good on me, I couldn't resist. And he said, well, you should have said, get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> and she said, I did. And he told me it looked better from behind than in the front. Amen? We have to learn how to put on love and do what's right and make right choices and keep our commitments. So many people emotionally make commitments. The Bible says you should not make a commitment unless you first count the cost. What's it going to be like? What's it really going to be like when the goosebumps go away? What's it really going to be like when it's not new anymore? Let me tell you something. When something's new, I mean, people will move and come to work, come to St. Louis, come to work for us. You would just think they died and went to heaven. Oh, 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 oh I just can't believe I'm working for Joyce Meyer. I, I, they must think we're going to sit down and have a chat every day for about five hours. And then after being there a while, they find out they never see me because I'm not at my office that much. I'm everywhere else doing this. And then they find out we want them to work. <laughs> that we don't just float around on a cloud all day and sing the hallelujah chorus. <laughs> but we work and we expect excellence. It's amazing. The ideas that we have about things that are unrealistic. That's why you don't want to do things on emotions. You don't want to marry somebody just based on emotions. You want to make certain that you count the cost and that you're ready to really make a commitment. And you know that no matter what you do, I don't care what kind of a job you have, there's going to be days when you don't like it. <laughs> and there's going to be things about it that you don't like. And no matter what you do, there's going to be times when you're going to get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. When things lo lose their newness, then we find out who's really committed to see things through to the finish. We need to start doing what God wants us to do because He wants us to do it and stop being led by emotions. Is there anybody here who can say your emotions give you just a little bit of trouble? We are going to get some information on feelings, 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 and stop letting them rule us because we have no spiritual maturity as long as we're following feelings. I'm going to say again, we have to know how to feel wrong and still choose to do what's right. Well, I hope that today's teaching has helped you to be alert to the enemy's schemes and understand that you do have the power to disarm him. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Today we're offering a four CD audio series. We offer you the Word of God every day, and I will continue to do that because that is what's going to change our lives. We need the Word of God to be fed spiritually so we can be strong. If you didn't eat physical food, you would get sick and be weak and eventually just faint and not exist anymore. And we have to make sure that we feed on the Word of God and time in the presence of God so we can be strong spiritually. We're offering this series today called What the Devil Doesn't Want You to Know. And believe me, there's plenty that he doesn't want you to know. And here are the four teachings. Cracking the enemy's code, how to build a fortress of faith, confronting your accusers, and what to wear to the war. And that's a very good teaching that will be surprising to you and really, I think, teach you a lot. So be sure you take advantage of this offer today. I think it's going to be a real blessing to you. And remember, make time every day for the Word of God. Use your time wisely. And any time that you can be playing the Word of God on these electronic formats and getting the Word in you is just a very wise thing to do. You have a great day. I love you. And I believe that God's got a good plan for your life.